Today on America's Test Kitchen, Bridget and Julia bake a classic Italian bread, Pani Francesi. And Aaron makes Bridget a foolproof chicken Vesuvio. It's all coming up right here on America's Test Kitchen. Pane Francese is the Italian cousin of the French baguette. And in fact, Pane Francese translates to French bread in Italian. Now, unlike the exalted baguette for which there are baking competitions all over the world, Pane Francese is just a good old loaf of bread, perfect for making sandwiches or dipping in oil. And today, Bridget's going to show us how to make it. This is not in second place to mm -hmm. baguette in any way. Great crumb. We're looking for a nice lacy crumb on the inside. Really good flavor, too. A little tanginess and a beautiful crust. Mm -hmm. And it's bigger, so you can actually make a sandwich with it. So there's more to eat. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we like it already. First thing we're going to do is we're going to make a sponge. I've got a half cup of room temperature water. We're going to add 2 thirds cup or 3 and 2 thirds ounces of bread flour. And this is 1 eighth teaspoon of rapid rise or instant yeast. Just going to mix this together. Now I'm going to put a piece of plastic on here, and you want to let this sit at room temperature for at least six hours. The yeast is going to start to feed off the natural sugars of the flour, and it's going to start to bubble and ferment. Okay, so a minimum of six hours. How long can you let it sit? Up to 24. All right. So let's take a look at the sponge here. Looks quite different. Yes. You can see it's all lacy, it's bubbling. Mm. It's actually risen and it's collapsed. Mm -hmm. You can see because of the way it's clinging to the sides of the and measuring cup. you can cup. smell it. Yes, that is all those byproducts of the fermentation process. So we're about to use this, but we need to loosen it up a bit before we turn it into a dough. So I've got another one and a quarter cups of room temperature water. And I'll just stir this together until it's incorporated. All right, so that looks pretty good. So let's move on to the mixer. Now, again, we're turning this into a dough, so we gotta use some more flour. Mm -hmm. So I have two and two thirds cups, and that's 14 and two thirds ounces. And we're gonna add one and a half teaspoons more of the instant yeast, or rapid rise. And I'll just quickly whisk this together to make sure that the yeast is dispersed evenly. So now I'm going to turn this to low and add our sponge mixture gradually. We're going to let this mix until it starts to come together into mm -hmm. a cohesive mass. That's going to take about two minutes. Now, I might need to go in there a couple of times and scrape down the sides. The dough hook is great at doing a lot of things, but at the very beginning when you're mixing a dough, it's not great at grabbing all the ingredients yep. from the sides. So we'll let that go for two minutes. All right. There we go. So let's take a look at this. You can see it's come together. Mm -hmm. Really no more dry pockets of flour in there. So now we're going to take the dough hook off and we're going to leave this be. And this is something called auto lease. Mm -hmm. So we're going to leave it for about 20 minutes. And during that time, gluten is going to form on its own. It's going to start to build that network. All right, so I need that piece of plastic from there you. There we go. Great. So we're going to put this right on here, nice and tight. And we're going to let this sit for 20 more minutes. All right. All right, so a good 20 minutes has passed. Mm -hmm. Now Looks we can a little proceed. more relaxed. It does. Aren't we all? <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to put the hook back on, make sure it's secure. Now we're going to add a tablespoon of extra virgin olive oil. Just for flavor. Flavor, a little bit of richness. And two and a quarter teaspoons of table salt. Now we didn't add salt earlier because again, that autolys, salt inhibits that process of gluten formation. So back down. And now I'm going to mix this on medium low speed for about five minutes. All right. So that's looking good. The dough is nice and smooth. So we're done with the mixer at this point. Now we're going to let this rise for a bit and I want to get it out of our mixer. I've got an oiled bowl scraper here. It's just going to help me manage the sticky hydrated dough. And now I'm transferring it to an oiled bowl. There we go. Cover it with a little bit of plastic wrap. And at this point, we're going to let it rise. We're going to let it go for about 30 minutes. That's it. That's it. All right, it's been a half an hour. Get that plastic off of the bowl. And you can see it's risen just a bit. Now we want to start developing a really good structure, some larger holes and some smaller holes. We're going to do that with a series of folding. So you can use, again, a bowl scraper that's been oiled. I like to oil my fingers and use those instead because you get a chance to work with the dough. Mm -hmm. So you just pick up a little bit of dough and bring it right into the center and rotate the bowl about 45 degrees and then do it again. And you're gonna do this eight times around the bowl. Six, mm. seven, eight. So let me get some plastic wrap back on that. We're gonna let this rise for another 30 minutes and then I'm gonna do the same thing <laughs> again. Fold it eight times 
After that, the plastic wrap goes back on and then we're really gonna let it rise another hour to an hour and a half until it's nearly doubled in size. All right. Well, after all that folding and rising, mm. we have a beautiful dough mm -hmm. and we're just about ready to shape it. Just like a baguette, we are going to use a French couche. This is a baker's couche. It's just a piece of heavy duty linen. It's going to cradle the bread. So okay. it's going to keep it in that nice loaf shape, that long baguette or the long torpedo shape. Mm -hmm. Now, could you use something else if you didn't have this, like a piece of parchment or something? No, it really would stick. This is so cheap. You can pick it up, you can roll it up, put it in your drawer, you can keep it. If you bake a lot of bread, this is something that you want to have. Okay. All right. So we do need to prep it. One of the great things about a couche or linen is that it wicks some of the moisture away from the bread so you get that beautiful crust. It can do the job a little too well. <laughs> so we do want to take the back side of the piece of linen, and I'm going to spray it just with a little bit of water. We're going to flip it over. Now I've got it resting on this overturned baking sheet for structure. Now I want to flour the top of this really well. So moisture on the back side, mm -hmm. flour on the front side. That's right. All right, so that looks good. It's worked into the fibers of the linen. Move on over, you're gonna work. All right, about time. <laughs> the first thing that I wanna do, flour the bench pretty well. It's a very moist dough. I like to dust the top with a little bit of flour. Again, it's very, very sticky. Mm -hmm. So we're going to plop this out onto our surface. Oh, look at that. Oh. Movement in that dough. It is gorgeous. It's jiggly. <laughs> a little bit more flour on top. Flour my hands. And now I want to pat this out into about a 12 by 6 inch rectangle. And any of these big, giant bubbles, mm -hmm. anything bigger than an inch, I'm going to kind of deflate it at this point. All right, let me see where we are. Again, I want 12 inches by 6. So I'm just going to squish this guy up a little bit. You can see I'm not being too tender with it. All right, so now I'm going to cut this in half. And I'm going to give half to you. All right. All right. So we're starting with roughly a six inch square. You might find that it's a little sticky if you need to drag the bottom side under a little bit of flour. That's okay. And now we're going to pat it out to a seven inch square. So now we're going to take the top two corners and we just bring it right down into the center. And then this little point right in the middle, that comes in as well. And each time that you make a fold like that, you just really want to get it so that it's adhering. And now, making sure that your fingers are floured if need be, you're just going to roll that down till it meets the other edge. Now you see this little edge here where the two seams are meeting. Mm -hmm. You can take your fingers and press them, or if you really want to make sure, you just take the heel of your hand. You kind of press it like that, and you'll really find those oh, yeah. bubbles in there. You want about 15 inch long by two and a half inch wide. All right. Yes. I'm on it. That looks really good. But now we want to get these pointy edges mm -hmm. that are so characteristic of Pane Francese. We're going to go ahead and roll just the ends so you get these nice points. We're going to transfer these seam side up. So I'll cradle the two ends. We're going to move it over to the couche. Here we go. We're going to pleat the couche again. This is to form that kind of cradle. Mm -hmm. To help keep its shape as it rises. That's right. All right, that looks perfect. And now. The second one, again, seam side up right beside that first one. And then I'm going to fold over the rest of the linen. Again, you want to make sure that they stay roughly in place there. Now, I've got a big old bag. <laughs> We're going to place this inside the bag. We're trapping in the moisture there, making sure that the bread doesn't dry out. So you can tie this, you can bind it, whatever you want to do. I like to just simply leave it on the counter and fold it underneath, nice and easy. So now we're gonna let this sit here for about a half an hour, up to an hour, and what we're looking for is the dough is going to rise. When I press on each of those loaves with my knuckle, it should bounce back. In the meantime, we need to heat up the oven and we need to set it all up. Each of these disposable pie plates contains a quart of lava rocks. This is the answer to creating a great steamy environment for the bread because steam really is key here. You can find these at the hardware store. They're usually right beside the wood chips for the grill. So if you would grab one of those, we're going to go over the oven. So this is a cold oven right here. We're going to put our rocks in there on the lower rack, just like so. And on this lower middle rack, we have here a baking stone. We're going to heat our oven to 450. All right, let's check and see what's going on in here. Remember, these were rising mm -hmm. at least 30 minutes to an hour. 
Oh, Not beautiful. They are gorgeous. <laughs> All right, so I am going to get rid of this sheet as well. We there we go. So now the key is how do we get these loaves yeah. onto our pizza peel? This baking peel we've already lined with a little bit of parchment paper, but we can't just pick these up. Mm -mm. They are jiggly and very <laughs> fragile. So first thing we want to do is unpleat our couche and then dust these with a little bit more flour on top because we're gonna flip them over by using a flipping board. This is just a very thin piece of wood. You can actually use a piece of cardboard as well. We've got instructions on our website for that. But this just goes in at about a 20 degree angle next to the loaf and you quickly flip it right over. So now it was seam side up, now it's seam side down. So now we're going to grab our couche here and flip it right back on. Ooh, that was easy. That was easy. And then, seam side up, goes right onto our parchment, just like that. Lovely. So same thing here, I need to flip it right onto our flipping board, and now over to our peel and our parchment. And we wanna space this about three inches in between the two lobes, like that. Very cool. And we can straighten it if we need to using the flipping board. Now these are about ready to go in, but I need to create some steam mm -hmm. first. So I've got some boiling water here, a half a cup. We're gonna add this in two additions, a half cup each time. So I'm going to go over to the oven, pour this into one of those pie plates. You're gonna see some big old steam. Close the door quickly, and we're gonna let that steam for about a minute. All right, so first edition of steam. Now we get to score these loaves. I'm using a baker's lamb for this. I've sprayed it with a little bit of vegetable oil spray just for best case scenario. Mm -hmm. You wanna hold it at about a 30 degree angle and be sure of your cut, stopping about a half an inch from either end. There we go. Could you use a razor blade if you didn't have one of these fancy devices? You could, but these are just a few bucks and it's made exactly for this job. Gotcha. So these are ready to load into that oven. I'm gonna ask you to pour another half cup over the other pie plate full of lava rocks. I'm gonna mm. let these bake until the internal temperature is about 205 to 210 degrees. That's gonna take anywhere from 20 to 25 minutes, but during that time I'll go in there and rotate the bread around. <laughs> oh, those are gorgeous. All right, there we go. If you could get the rack for me, thank you. you. Got it. Yes, I believe these are acceptable. <laughs> they're, they're beautiful. Beautiful. So I'm gonna slide these off the parchment. We're mm -hmm. looking for a temperature around 205 to 210 degrees. And we've got 206. Let's try the other one here. Beautiful. Now the bad news. We gotta let them cool. A lot of moisture in there, the gels and the starches have to set up. So three hours is ideal. Okay. All right. You've been so patient. Mm, I have been. Almost three hours, <laughs> not even close. <laughs> but it's time to cut in to one of these oh. beautiful loaves. Gorgeous. Oh. oh. That's enough slices for us. <laughs> I'll give you a slice here, one for me. I like to tear it apart. I like to taste the center. <laughs> mm. Mm -hmm. That bread has some serious flavor. Really, really complex mm -hmm. flavor. And that's from all that fermentation time and the sponge that we gave that. Yeah, it's weedy, it's deep. We've got a little bit of olive oil if you'd like to dip the bread in there. And I love that that crust is substantial. Mm -hmm. Very moist inside mm -hmm. as well. This is delicious. <laughs> it's not bad. <laughs> So if you want to make a pane francese, start by making a sponge with some of the flour, yeast, and water. And let it sit for six hours before adding the rest of these ingredients and making the dough. Let the dough rest for 20 minutes, then add the salt and knead it thoroughly using the dough hook and a stand mixer. Let the dough rise for two to two and a half hours, but fold it over using a greased bowl scraper or your hands twice during this time. Once it's risen, Press, fold, and stretch it into two long loaves, then let them lounge on a covered canvas couche to rise again before baking. Heat the oven to 450 degrees and place two pans of lava rocks on the lower rack. With the help of a board, transfer the loaves to a parchment-lined pizza peel. Pour the water on the lava rocks to create steam in the oven and slice the bread along the top before loading it into the oven. Be sure to let it cool completely before giving it to your best friend. <laughs> From America's Test Kitchen to your kitchen, Fabulous new recipe for pane francese. Brava. Hmm. Prego. Va bene. How are you
Chicago's deep dish pizza might get nationwide love, but Chicken Vesuvio is largely relegated to the state borders of Illinois. That's a real shame because this restaurant dish features chicken, potatoes, wine, lemon, garlic. So good, and it should be enjoyed everywhere. Luckily, Erin's here, and she's going to show us how to bring Chicken Vesuvio home. I am. And Bridget, it sounds easy, but it was kind of difficult. I had to re-engineer the whole uh -huh. recipe from top to bottom, and I want to show you how. Great. Okay? So we're going to start with the potatoes. I have Yukon Gold potatoes here. These are about two to three inches in diameter. Usually the potatoes are cut into wedges, but I'm actually going to cut these in half across the narrowest part of the potato. That's it. That's it. So I'm just going to cut those in half and put them in here. So we have one and a half pounds of Yukon Gold potatoes. I'm going to toss them with a tablespoon of vegetable oil and one teaspoon of kosher salt. I'm just going to toss this and coat the potatoes with the oil and the salt. Okay. So we're going to put those aside. Now we're going to move on to the chicken. So I'm using eight chicken thighs. Each one is about five to seven ounces and okay. they're bone in. So skin side down and trim the edges. We want enough skin to cover the chicken thigh. We don't want to trim too, too much. Okay. Because we want that skin to turn really crispy. We also want it to render its fat into our dish. Now I'm just going to pat them dry with paper towels, and I'm going to season them with a total of one and a half teaspoons of kosher salt and a half teaspoon of pepper, both sides. So our chicken's ready. Now we're ready to cook. Okay. Uh, we're using a roasting pan here. You need a pan that is at least 12 inches wide and 16 inches big, and this is going to hold enough chicken and potatoes for four people. Okay. Can you turn the burners on? We're going to turn two burners on to yeah. medium high. All right. And then we're going to brown our chicken, and I'm going to add a tablespoon of oil, and while that oil is heating up, I'm going to go wash my hands. Sounds good. Okay, Bridget, while our oil is heating up, I'm going to move on to two other ingredients. We have a tablespoon of lemon juice and two cloves of garlic that I've minced. And I'm going to combine the two. These are two key signature flavors in chicken Vesuvio. And I'm going to tame the garlic flavor by adding the lemon juice. All right, Bridget, our oil is getting hot. So we're going to give the chicken a head start. I'm going to oh, put yeah. skin side down. So I'm going to let these cook for about two to three minutes just while the fat starts to render and so until I get about two to three tablespoons of chicken fat. Okay. In the meantime, let's take a closer look at how lemon tempers the bite of garlic. An intact clove of raw garlic doesn't have the bite we associate with raw garlic. Its flavor comes from a mild tasting compound called allium. When garlic is cut, crushed, or chewed, its cells are broken open, allowing an enzyme called allinase to combine with mild allium. In the presence of air, a chemical reaction converts the mild allium to a third pungent compound, allicin, which gives raw garlic its bite. When an acidic ingredient like lemon juice is quickly added to the cut garlic, the acid mostly prevents the enzyme from forming allicin, the pungent compound. So for a milder garlic flavor, just add lemon. Okay, so you can see all that fat that's rendered out of the skin. The chicken is not fully browned right now, and also you can see that it's browning a little unevenly, and that's because we're cooking over two burners. So it's really important when cooking over two burners to really move the food around, make sure that it browns evenly. So I'm just gonna move the chicken towards the center. I'm gonna add our potatoes. And I'm gonna put them around the perimeter of the pan. I wanna put the cut side down and so that it browns in the chicken fat and they're gonna taste really good later on. Now we're gonna add two more signature flavors. We're gonna add one and a half teaspoons of dried oregano. I'm gonna sprinkle it just right over the chicken and the potatoes as they brown, and a half a teaspoon of dried thyme. Beautiful, and dried is fine here. Dried is fine here. Oregano and thyme are very hearty, and once we add the wine, there's plenty of moisture to rehydrate them and to let other flavors permeate into the sauce. Well, that's good news that dried herbs work perfectly here, but if we do wanna substitute fresh, a good rule of thumb, is that for every one part of dried herbs, you can substitute three parts of fresh. So I'm gonna continue the chicken potato dance for another eight to 12 minutes. I'm just gonna keep shifting them around until they're nice and evenly browned. And as they get browned, I will flip them over. All right, as you can see, these have been browning and I've been flipping them over as they brown. Yeah, beautiful. Gorgeous. All that browning means flavor. Now comes the garlic. So I have 12 cloves here that I've cut in half lengthwise. So 24 halves of garlic and I'm gonna tuck them in between the potatoes and the chicken. And now I'm gonna add one and a half cups of dry white wine. I'm just gonna add it to the side. I don't wanna pour it over the chicken because I just took all that time to brown it. Okay, Bridget, we are ready to go into the oven. We're gonna cook this at 450 degrees for about 15 to 20 minutes until the chicken is cooked through and the potatoes are nice and tender when cooked with the knife. Oh, 
go up. <laughs> exactly, dive in is right. The potatoes are really tender. The knife is going in without any resistance. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna take the temperature of the chicken. We're cooking this to 185 to 190. Great, so we are there. The potatoes are gorgeous, look at those. So good. Golden brown. Look at that crispy ah, chicken skin. Beautiful. I'm gonna chop this up, mash it into a paste, and put it back into the sauce. While I chop this up, can you please turn the burner on to medium heat? We're gonna let the sauce reduce down. You bet. I'm just gonna chop, chop, chop. Okay, so now I'm just using the side of my knife. I wanna smear it on that cutting board and really mash it into a paste so it just melts right into our sauce. Nice. Yeah. Okay, so I wanna stir all this fawn back into our sauce, fawn this flavor. I'm gonna add our garlic wow. paste to our sauce. Wow. I'm gonna whisk this in. I'm gonna let this continue to reduce for about another uh, three to five minutes until it's nice and thick and it coats the back of the spoon. That is a beautiful sauce. Isn't it? Remember that garlic that we had earlier? The yep. garlic and lemon juice? So we're just gonna pour this in. We wanted to add one more last kick of garlic to this and also we wanted to brighten up the sauce. And we're gonna add one tablespoon of chopped parsley. So I'm just gonna pour this into our gravy boat. Every last <laughs> drop, every last drop. Oh yes. One more tablespoon of parsley over the potatoes and the chicken. You want two potatoes? Yes, please. All right. Oh, they are beautiful. One chicken thigh. Oh. That is gorgeous, thank you. Yep. Some sauce. And you're pouring it around the chicken and potatoes because you don't want exactly. to get that crust soggy. Chicken, here I come. Mm. Unbelievable. And the wine that comes through. The wine is just like a subtle acidity. That's what it is. And the sauce is just, it clings to every bite. With a little bit of thyme, the oregano, the wine, the garlic, yep. two ways. Yep. And of course, lemon. This is beautiful. Thank you so much for bringing it to our homes. You're welcome. Well, to recreate this classic Chicago restaurant dish, brown chicken thighs, add halved Yukon gold potatoes, and sprinkle with dried oregano and thyme. Flip the potatoes and chicken, tuck in halved garlic cloves, pour in white wine, and roast. Platter the chicken and potatoes and finish the sauce with mashed roasted garlic, lemon, and parsley. From our test kitchen to your kitchen, the iconic and exceptional chicken Vesuvio. I'm gonna need more chicken skin. I'm with you. Why can't they put skin on both sides of the chicken? Thanks for watching America's Test Kitchen. What'd you think? Well, leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or you can just say hello. You can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. I'll see you later.